one of the best weeks of the year in the Pac-12. Football rivalry week. Notre Dame, USC, Oregon, Oregon State, and Washington, Washington State in the Apple Cup. Breaking it all down. Let's go. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the final week of the regular season and rivalry week here in the Pac-12 and another episode of Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thanks so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Conference of Champions. Like, comment, subscribe, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch the show. We just hit 1,300 subs on the YouTube channel. Thank you all for making that happen. And my thanks to Carter Baines, senior writer and editor at beaverblitz.com calm to come on the show and talk about what a glorious week of football this is going to be the last couple weeks frankly have been outstanding but gosh the stakes the matchups the rivalries the intensity carter this might be the best weekend of the year like i mean it's always very fun don't get me wrong but it feels like the stakes are so much higher this year when you talk about oregon and oregon state both being ranked you talk about washington being on on the verge of a New Year's Six Bowl now in the Apple Cup. Uh, USC playing for a playoff board. Like, there haven't been this many meaningful games in the Pac-12 like at the very end of the season in, in quite some time. Yeah, and you've got such a deep lineup of teams. Half the Pac-12 is ranked going into the last week of the regular season. I mean, let's uh, hire a statistician that I can't afford to figure out when, when the last time that happened was. But let's start with USC and Notre Dame, the biggest game of the week in the Pac-12 because of the college football playoff ramifications that are there. I still think Notre Dame stinks, Carter. However, they are not the same exact team that lost to Stan. Like, they're, they're playing better football because early in the year, they lost to bad teams. Now they are beating bad teams, and they're beating them the way that you should. But for me, I, I feel good about USC in this spot, I looked at that five and a half number, considered it for the Pac-12 prime picks, and was like, mm, I don't know. That's uh, I like I don't love the numbers that that you have across the Pac-12 this week. But then again, what do I know? I'm a little under 500 on the season. So I look at this game with Notre Dame and, and USC, and I feel good about the Trojans at home. Lot to play for, rivalry game. I think the Trojans are the better team overall though Notre Dame's got the better defense, I just don't think for a team in Notre Dame that's going to be relying on that side of the ball to slow down the Trojans, I don't think anybody, Oregon State did for a week, can really slow down Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley with the way they're humming on that side of the ball right now. The one thing that scares me when you look at Notre Dame from a USC perspective is that win over Clemson. I mean, that was pretty, they got it done, uh, was nothing short of incredibly impressive. Um, but it's a Notre Dame team that, again, has also lost to Stanford. It lost to Marshall. And sure, it is a different team than than the one that lost to those. But um, do we have any confidence that the, the Fighting Irish can slow down USC? I mean, holding Clemson scoreless is, is impressive, but that Clemson offense is frankly not very good. Um, and it's certainly not Caleb Williams, Jordan Addison level good. Um, so you, I mean, USC is going to score on everybody that's not named Oregon state apparently this year. And, uh, I, I think the five Irish are, are the, kind of the next in line to, to get boat raced offensively, at least. I mean, Notre Dame could potentially keep this thing close. Um, but I just don't see enough there from the fighting Irish who again, are still, you know, probably the, the most fraudulent top 20 team in the country. Oh yeah. Um, a, a team. Oh, if, if it wasn't named Notre Dame, probably. They wouldn't be in the national spotlight right now, given its resume. Uh, USC has so much more to play for, too, that uh, I just think that you know it, it, it would feel really wrong and weird for the, the Trojans to play a letdown game in this one. I, I agree. And even though they've already got their slot in the Pac-12 championship, they, of course, can't have a mistake when their next two games are probably into the college football playoff. And 
the Notre Dame offense has really picked things up. Now they're going through the ACC, and I don't think USC's defense is going to provide you know more resistance than any, any of those teams. But I think you know football has a little bit of a give and take. Your defense plays well, can help your offense with field position. Your offense plays well, gives your defense a break, that sort of thing. But in their five game winning streak, listen to these offenses that 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 Notre Dame has gone up against. UNLV, yeah, okay. I don't need to say anything else. Syracuse, completely cratered in the second half. Very predictable. Clemson was the most fraudulent 10-0 team, what, in the history of football? And I, I think Notre Dame exposed that. Give them credit, for sure. But they've had quarterback controversy all season long. Their defense has been good, but their offense hasn't been there. Navy, which they only beat by three, might I add, and runs the triple option, still put up 32 points on the Fighting Irish. And Boston College got blank last week, and Boston College is kind of in the Colorado space. They're barely even a Power 5 program at at this point. So I think that Notre Dame is playing with a lot of confidence, but as a as an outsider to the Irish, so to speak, I look at that and say, yeah, this USC team is going to present a different caliber of opponent in terms of what your defense is going up against. And I, you know, from what I have seen from Notre Dame, I just think USC is faster across the board. It's very difficult to pick up quality wins in the ACC really any year, but this year in particular, when you talk about Clemson being there, I mean, North Carolina just lost uh, to Georgia Tech and, and we're kind of the, the standard bearer. Uh, in their division. So, you know, you look at the resume for Notre Dame and and nothing jumps out at all except for that win over Clemson, which again, doesn't really play much offense this year. So USC will be the best team that Notre Dame Dame plays this year. And uh, considering again, some of those losses that it's faced, you know, it's, it's kind of an, an, it's, it's hard to judge Notre Dame for those losses when it also has one of the best wins in college football this year. But USC has been the more consistent team this year. And uh, I, I think, frankly, it's it's a better team, right? Comfortable with, with saying that the Trojans are, are going to win and cover. Maybe a look ahead to the, the Pac-12 prime picks. Yeah, I that, that was my instinct. But then I just look at Notre Dame. I'm like, man, are they just going to try and run the football, keep it away from Caleb Williams and USC, which I think is Oregon State showed is the formula for limiting their offense. You also have to play very well defensively. Marcus Freeman comes from that side of the ball and you know certainly takes a lot of pride in what the Fighting Irish do defensively. But I, I just look at USC and think, man, they, they've had one off week offensively all season long against a team that I think is better than Notre Dame in Oregon State that's got a really good defense and it was on the road, and this is at USC. This is inside the Coliseum. Caleb Williams is in some kind of zone. He is in a Heisman zone, literally and and metaphorically. And I, I just feel like that's that's a lot for Notre Dame to to overcome. And I, I just feel better about USC. I, I might, by the end of the show, end up putting USC there. It's minus five and a half, according to our friends at, uh, at, at Bet Online right now. But... There's more than one way to get in on the gambling action. You can check out Underdog Fantasy as well, the easiest place to spice up the college football season, which doesn't have as long as we would uh, like it to have at this point in time. But still plenty to play for. It's got an easy-to-play format and available in over 30 states. Go sign up with the promo code Locked On, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. You go in there, pick between two and five players, your team or any other team, or you can go more if you're feeling dangerous and Choose whether they will be over or under their totals. You deposit 100 bucks with that promo code locked on, you get $100 free. Go to underdogfantasy.com or find the Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store or Google Play Store. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code locked on, one word, to get in on the college football pick'em action today. All right, let's move to our next game here in the Pac-12. And... That next game is Oregon and Oregon State, which is a fascinating matchup. (laughs) Oh, the chainsaws will be out at Reister Stadium on on Saturday. And I'm going to laugh about that little uh, toy chainsaw. And uh, Oregon will try to make it such that the Beavers are only able to use metaphorical toy chainsaws in, in this game. But... It's a three-point line for a reason, Carter. Oregon State's a good team. They've been really good at home. Bo Nix has hobbled, and that caps what Oregon can do offensively. 
And they've only done that for a week, whereas Oregon State also limited a quarterback with Ben Goldbranson has at least been doing it for, what, six six weeks now? Five, five, six weeks? Like, he's been there for more games than Chance Nolan has played in at this point in the season. Or at least it, it feels that way. Correct me if, if I'm wrong. But I, I would, of course, on a personal level, love to come on here and say, yeah, I think Oregon is going to blow him out. But I don't think they will. I think that line is tight. For a reason, and I expect a, a, a dogfight here, a metaphorical one, of course, since it's a you know a couple of platta 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 pie, a, a beaver and a duck. I don't know, a beaver and a and a mallard, a duck, whatever you want to call it. I think this will be a good game. Start number eight for Bengal Branson, a quarterback for Oregon State, and he's gotten pretty much, I mean, unquestionably better on a weekly basis since he took over for Chance Nolan. And I think that culminated last week with his best his best game of the year against Arizona State, in which he ran nine times for about 40 yards and a touchdown in addition to completing 15 of his first 17 passes. And if he plays like that against Oregon secondary, which is probably the worst he's faced this year, uh, Oregon State's going to be able to move the ball on. If we see the Bengal Branson that is more of that game manager type guy who just wants to hand it off to his quarterback or to his running back and get the ground game going, Oregon State's going to struggle offensively. This is not an Oregon team that you can afford to struggle offensively against. Even with Bo Nix not at 100%, Oregon's going to be able to... Uh, the Beavers' defense is, is, is far improved from any of the ones that have faced Oregon in recent years. But this Ducks team has scored 40 points in all but three of its games. Uh, and I just don't see the Beavers slowing them down to a great extent. Now, I said that before. Oregon State played USC at Reeser Stadium. I mean, in fact, no team has put up more than 17 at Reeser this year. That is an X factor to take into consideration here. That home field advantage is very real at Reeser Stadium, uh, even at reduced capacity. It's an intriguing game. It's going to be closer than some people might think. Uh, nationally televised on AB Pacific. It's a big spot. It's the first time we've had a ranked on ranked matchup in this series in a decade. And man, it's been fun to preview and it's going to be fun to cover. Yeah, it, it should be a good game. And I, I think it's going to, to hinge almost entirely Carter on which team runs the ball better. I, I think it's that simple. You can point to a lot of keys, you know, both quarterbacks got to be able to protect the ball. Oregon coming off a week in which they had three interceptions of Cam Rising, who typically doesn't throw a lot of interceptions, if they bring that sort of defensive effort, it could be a long day for Ben Goldbranson. This Oregon State secondary across the board, one through four, probably the best in the Pac-12. Oregon's receivers have been exceptional this year, including a week ago, even though the offense managed just just 20 points against Utah with Bo Nix hurt. But this is a bigger challenge. You can go to all that sort of stuff. But I think because of what Oregon does well defensively, in, in stopping the run, that, that's been their biggest strength this year, and they've been very good at it. And also offensively with a limited Bo Nix, and that caps the plays you can call, the explosiveness of the offense. We saw it against Utah last week. I really do think, if not win the game, have a huge advantage and be in a position to win the game, is just going to come down to which team runs the ball more effectively because it's going to be so critical to what they do offensively. Oregon State all the time, and Oregon has run the ball well this year, but they've had a much more explosive and consistent passing attack than Oregon State has had. But I think the ground game becomes more important with Bo Nix certainly healthier than he was last week, but he will not be 100%. Matchup for Oregon State in a lot of ways, uh, but the one the one position group on position group or uh, you know scheme against and scheme that stands out is and the run defense for both sides. You know, these are two of the top 25 rushing offense in the country, but they're also two of the top 25 rushing defenses in the country. So whoever wins that at the point of attack, I think is going to be positioned pretty well to win this thing. If Oregon State can run the ball against Oregon, I like the Beavers' chances of winning this because I think they're going to be able to pass it against the Ducks. And that's something that they haven't been able to do in a lot of games. Um, so if the Beavers can maintain San Martinez over that 100-yard mark for the sixth straight game, I think the Beavers are going to win this thing. But, man, what, what Oregon's got in that rushing offense and, and that front seven is, is about as stout as they come as far as stopping it, the Beavers are going to be 
contested at, at the line of scrimmage on both sides. Really, I don't think we can say about Oregon State for much of this year. I think Oregon State has been the better team um, in in those matchups in most games, and so you know it's it's probably it's probably the toughest matchup for Oregon State all year. Um, and you know it's it's an Oregon State team that is taking care of business against teams that it quote unquote to the teams that it has been an underdog to. Kind of has a feeling of of one of those. Uh, you know, Oregon State's not favored. They're probably going to lose a close one like they have in, in some of the others. But uh, again, maintaining balance on offense for Oregon State, that's the key. If they do it, they can win this thing. The, the interesting thing for Oregon's defense here is that defensive front. And that includes the linebackers because they blitz them a lot, as they should. Noah Sewell uh, especially has had a propensity to get after the quarterback. His you know, blitz and free run at Cam Rising last week forced an early throw that led to an interception that resulted in Oregon ultimately uh, eventually icing the game. So I, I think their their defensive front all season long, Oregon, they're, they're two linebackers, right? They run a 4-2-5. They're two linebackers, four defensive linemen, been really, really good against the run. But against the pass, it's been on and off. They were good against a bad offensive line in Cal, but against Washington, Michael Penix had all day to throw. And I think the upside here, if you're Oregon State, is that offensive line is really good. And if they're not able to run the ball well and you're relying more on the right arm of Ben Goldbranson, that's not where you want to be if you're Oregon State. But the upside there is, well, he should have time to throw if they play up to their potential. Now, Cam Rising was under pressure a lot more often last week. So if it looks more like that, I don't think that favors Oregon State. I think it certainly favors the Ducks, but I, I do think that Oregon State's offensive line is capable of of giving Goldbranson the the time he needs to to throw. I think this is I think this is a close competitive game. You know Oregon State's going to be fired up. I mean this is a game that as a program they circle on their calendar every year as, as much as anyone. Right? I mean for them this year it was probably the the, the two non conference games, USC and then Oregon. And, and those are kind of the games where they're like, yeah, we're, we're going to bring another another level for for that. But uh, re- real quick, Carter, just a couple final thoughts there. And, and if you want to drop a prediction, go ahead. Yeah, I, I haven't gone on the record with any prediction yet, but I do agree with you. This is going to be a, a lower scoring game than we've seen from these teams in the past. You know, when when these two teams square off, usually it's one in the 30s or as I believe it was last year. I, I think it was a you know, yeah, a high 30, 20s, low 40s, 28, 37, 28. That sound right? Yeah, something yeah, like I'll that. that I, I think this game will be one in the upper 20s. Um, again, no team has scored more than 17 on Oregon State at home. Um, and, and, and the Beavers defense, even with some injuries, I think is good enough to slow down Bo Nix and, and this offense, even if, uh, or especially if he's not at 100%. So, um, you know, if, if I had to throw something out there right now, I'd, I'd, I'd maybe say Oregon 31, Oregon State 27. Somewhere. Um, and I, I think when I do officially go on the record with a prediction, it'll probably be right around there. But whichever team wins, it's not going to be my, by more than a touchdown. This will come down to the wire, and I think it has instant classic potential uh, as another just incredible installment in this 126-year series. Good teams, great rivalry, plenty on the line, has the makings for a great college football game. It's 38-29 last year. I don't think it'll even be that high scoring. I, I've got Oregon 27 to, to 17. I, I think that with the way the Ducks defense performed last week, if they bring that sort of energy and that mindset and approach, and it seems like Dan Lanning kind of inserted himself more on the defensive side of the ball after the Washington disaster, I think if that happens again, Oregon can can hold the bees under 20 points. But I will say, Carter, I'm with you on the low scoring front. Last year was 38-29. I think first team to 20 points wins. They might not end at 20 points, but I think the first team to get to 20 points probably wins the game. What about the Apple Cup? What a game that could be. That line's even smaller than this one. It's in Pullman. It should be a sold-out crowd, and we'll tell you everything we you need to know about it after I talk to you about upside. Inflation has us all thinking about different ways to cut back, whether it's driving less, dining out less, buying less from a grocery store. We can all agree there's nothing fun 
about less. That's why I started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who does things like buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With Upside, I don't have to cut back because I get cash back on every purchase. It's easy and you can do it too. Download the free Upside app. Use promo code LOCK to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code LOCKED. The third big rivalry game of the weekend, Carter, Washington, Washington State in Pullman. Huskies favored by a deuce, minus two at 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 Washington State's home field. And I I can go either way on this one. I, I, I really can. You've got two teams that have won, I believe, a combined seven, eight, nine consecutive games. Like no neither of these teams has lost in the month of November going back to late October. If memory serves, the last loss was Washington State losing to Oregon State. Since then, it's been all it's been all victories. And I look at or they lost to Utah, excuse me, on uh that was four four weeks ago now. So neither team has lost in November. Washington State's offense has really started to figure it out. The Huskies offense has been rolling all season long. Their defense has made some plays when they need to, but this is that classic battle of offensive team over here, Washington, defensively led team over here, Washington State. How do you see this one playing out? The coin flippiest of any game in the Pac-12 this week, Oregon State, which I think is very close. 100%. Um, uh, yeah, no, you, you you nailed it there. It's an offensive team against a defensive team. Um but the reason I, I think Washington State could, could surprise some people here is Washington State's a defensive team that also plays offense. You know, this isn't like a um, a cow team. I, it's not. It's not. It's exactly. not. It's not a cow team. Yeah, I was. I was thinking like, man, was there every year Utah just didn't play much offense? Um, it, it has the feeling of of a team that actually can slow down Michael Penix Jr., um, which there have been very few of those this year. Um, no, this is the game of the week, and I'm glad that uh, Oregon, Oregon State wraps up in the early afternoon so that I can hopefully get back up to the Portland area to watch this thing because um, I think it's intriguing, and I, I think the implications that it poses for Washington gives the Huskies a little bit of an edge too. Yep. So, you know, the Huskies need to win out. Um, well, of course, only the, they probably will not be going to the Pac-12 title game. I, I, the, it's not impossible. It's not, need... it's not impossible, but they need some help to do it. Um, yes. But... If, if they do win this game, I think there is a chance they could be going to new, to a New Year's Six Bowl. Um, there's some motivation there on top of the whole rivalry aspect. Um, you know, whether or not that's actually an X factor in this game, I don't know. But I, I feel like these two teams match up so well against each other that uh, it, it's, got, it's got the makings of one of those kind of nail-biter last second finishes like I think we'll see in Corvallis as well. Yeah, and I, I look at the the biggest determining factor in this game, probably the Washington State offense, because I trust the defense to, you can't stop Michael Penix and those Huskies receivers. They're too good. Offensive line's been really good. I think that's a fascinating matchup. I, I've liked what I've seen from Dane Henley and, and Ron Stone Jr. in that front seven for the Cougs this year, but that Washington offensive line running the ball here and there, you know, they have spurts. They have moments where it's really good, but pass protection, man, they've been they've been really, really good. I think the greatest example of that is the fact that here we are in week 13 and Michael Penix is still on the field. This is the most games he's ever played in his career because he's not getting hit very much. Yeah. I mean, he's been hurt each of his last three seasons at, at Indiana, unfortunately, and now he's he's getting the chance to show what he can do. And he's, you know, the nation's leading passer, which is which is not bad. But I think the biggest question in this game is is Washington State going to be able to score enough to keep up with the Huskies? Because I think a good defensive showing from Washington State would be anything under 30. Uh, I mean, the Huskies just haven't been slowed down. You know, that windy game in Seattle against the Beavs, that's a comparable defense to, you know, Oregon State, Washington State, both really, really good defenses there. But those were, what, 30, 25-mile-an-hour wins? And you're going to have some cold in this game, but I don't think it's going to be quite that that gusty i'll double check the, the the weather forecast here but i think that's the biggest question is a good defensive showing is if you hold the huskies to 24 points and, and that that would be a really good performance from the wazoo defense but then can the cougs offense 
get over that 24 point threshold. If they don't, I think you're asking too much to say, you know, we're going to win this game against Washington 21 to 17. I, I just don't think that that's possible. I am somewhat confident in the Cougars' ability to score some points in this game just because of how poor Washington's secondary has been this year. Which, again, I, I think we touched on this when we were previewing. It feels really weird to talk about Washington's back end of the defense being weak because year in and year out, they're one of the best in the, the conference. It's DBU. The country. It's DB exactly. University. Yeah, exactly. it is strange. I... And, you know, even with Cam Ward perhaps underperforming maybe our expectations this year. Uh, that's still a good quarterback and he's got some good receivers to throw to. And so I think they can make some things happen downfield. Uh, again, that, that front seven for Washington can create some problems. You know, it's, it's, they've got a couple of edge rushers who are up there with the best in the country. Um, but if, if Ward can avoid that pressure, I think they're going to be able to score some points over the top. So I think this thing could come down to the wire because it's, it's one of those things where, each matchup, you look at it and it's like, all right, well, that favors Washington. Well, this one favors Washington State, and it goes back and forth down the line. Um, so it, it'll come down to whichever team can take one of those advantages away, and it's it's going to be a close one regardless. Let's transition right into our uh, Pac-12 Prime Picks, our best bets of the week, brought to you, of course, by Bet Online. They have you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts, and they've got Washington State as a two-point home underdog here. I, I think that's about right, Carter. I think this, like you said, especially being in Pullman, is a 50-50 affair, and I think these are two good teams, and I think whichever one is at home, they now. One one factor you have to consider for Washington. A lot of players on that roster were there last year when they got housed by the Cougars on their home field. That's going to give them an extra level of motivation. But I still feel like which home, whichever team is at home here, has got the advantage. So first pick that uh, that that I'm giving out here on the show in my quest to get over 500 on the season, I I am going to take Washington State plus two. I could see the Huskies winning 28-27, but I I think the Cougars at the end of the day, can make just enough plays on defense to hold Washington at 24-point number. I think 27-24 final score. I, I think the Cougars get it done. Yeah, I don't have a play on this just because I, I do think it is too coin flippy for me to uh, to lean one side or another. Um, I, I guess maybe in that case, state. But I do think this has the potential for Washington. If, if one team is going to win by more than, more than three points, it's going to be Washington. Um, so that gives me hesitation there, but yeah, yeah, no, I, I, but I don't hate the pick. I don't hate the pick. Cause I, I do think this is a game that Washington state can win outright. Yeah. I, I think it's a go either way game. So I look at home field advantage and say, it's notable. Cougs have been a good team at, at home. So I'll, I'll take them there to, to win outright. But I agree if a team is winning by more than a few points, it's definitely more likely to, to be watched. I, I don't think the Cougs can you know, win by a touchdown or 10 points in, in, in this game. I think the teams are just too too evenly matched because I think Washington State's a good team, as I have for the last few weeks. So putting my uh, my Washington State confidence on the line here. I've been 4-0 when I pick them to cover a spread here on, on the show this season. Um, but they are the, the game because it's 50-50 that I feel least confident in. Next to, and this might be a surprise, Carter, but I'm, I like the Cardinal. I like the Stanford Cardinal plus 6.5. It's a lot of points at home, right? Just under a touchdown. I would like it more at seven and a half for sure. But look, Stanford is not good. But neither is BYU. BYU lost to East Carolina. The Cardinal are at home. They just lost a big rivalry game. I think they're going to come out and play for pride. And I think the Cougs are just, you know, they have the talent to be a better team. BYU was supposed to be an eight to 10 win team this year. Instead, they're looking at six. To, they're sitting at six right now, hoping to get to seven with this win. But to me, that spells that their coaching staff just hasn't been firing on all cylinders. And I think David Shaw can come up with something. And I watched that game against Cal. Sure, it was a rivalry game, but the Cardinal at least played hard. And if they can avoid fumbling the ball, which they do like 17 times a game, I think they, I think I am picking this. This is my upset of the week. I think the Cardinal win that game outright. I don't hate the number and, and I don't hate the pick, but I do hate trying to figure out what's going to happen between two incredibly unmotivated teams. Neither team has anything to play for except for pride. I mean, BYU's already going bowling. Stanford knows that it's it's done. David Shaw is 
probably not checked out because he's too good of a coach for that. But I mean, like the players might be, <laughs> they just lost to Cal. And that was, I mean, that's the biggest game on their schedule all year for a team. That's not going to do anything postseason wise. Um, yeah. You're betting on the Cardinal playing with pride. You're betting on BYU saying, yeah, this really doesn't matter to us either. Um, it's, it's a game that, that but I do feel like the number's about right. And, I, I don't hate the pick for uh, you know on, on your end taking the Cardinal to to cover and and to potentially win outright because weird things happen when you get you get games like this where really no I mean nobody has any reason to watch it uh, nobody really has much of a reason to play that's when that's when wacky stuff happens man and that and that's kind of part of my reasoning is like if I don't know what's going to happen there I'm going to lean with the points rather than the team that I think could be better but as you said. They're already bowl eligible, so they're you know, and they're going to play in a lower tier bowl anyway. So I wonder how motivated they will be. Stanford on Senior Day, at least, like I, I think they could at least cover the six and a half. But I'll take them to win twenty seven twenty one. Here's the pick I like most this week, Carter, and this is Friday's episode of the show. This game is happening tonight in the desert. I love Arizona minus four. Absolutely. That is my favorite pick of the week. Through all the struggles I've had this year, my favorite picks of the week, which has usually been Washington State, to be fair, has that they've been solid. Everything else up in the air. If you fade it, if you fade me on it, totally understand everybody. But Arizona minus four, I think they're a way better team than Arizona State. I'm with you on that one. I, I just watched Oregon State obliterate Arizona State on a game where, again, one of those where we just talked about with Stanford, Arizona State wasn't playing for anything in that game, but it was senior day. And you think maybe that gives them a little bit of juice. They scored seven points in that game, and Oregon State got everything it wanted on the offensive side of the ball. Arizona's a better potential, a better offensive team than Oregon State even. See the Wildcats running up the score on this thing, and and I don't think Arizona State has enough tools to, to ride with them there. You mentioned running it up. You know what the score of this game was last year? 70 to 7. Yeah. They got worked and there are plenty of players on that Arizona roster who I bet you remember remember that I bet you Jaden Delora knows that and wants to do something else you talk about culture building go beat your rival while they're down I think that I think that is the better of the week we are in agreement there Carter Bain senior writer and editor at beaverblitz.com what a week of football we've got in store can't wait oh yeah no go ahead rev it up rev, rev it, it up. up rev it up rev it up <laughs> <laughs> all excited good to talk with you as always my man oh yeah thanks for having me appreciate everyone listening i will see you next time enjoy the football this weekend and have a wonderful rest of your day